my thesis was very much focused on uh, kinship and social organization, and I think one of the conclusions that that uh, that comes out of this is, you know, following from the kind of thing that Needham said that there is no such thing as kinship per se. What we're talking about is sets of relationships that express a, a variety of things between people, land, resources. It could be all kinds of stuff. Um, so that was that was a, a key piece, but there were there were a lot of other parts that that um, I, I I thought about and I, I came to think about, and certainly from uh, some of the symbolic training and uh, that I'd done with with uh, Roger McDonnell and with Paul Buisak, uh other pieces that I wanted to think about, and one of the parts that that came out is as I acquired this little. Um, pendant. It's actually a pendant. It's supposed to have a thread through it, but it doesn't. Um, it was made by Pani Luke, uh, Kamenik's wife, Pani Luke. Uh, Pani Luke is my mother's sister, my mother's younger sister, uh, by the adoption system. Uh, it was made by her, and when I and I was just absolutely intrigued when I when I uh, picked it up, um, and so I asked her and Kamenik about it, and really all they would say their interpret interpretation on it was it's all about women. It's, it's, it's women. It's all about women. That's what it's all about. And then Kamenik went through and, and told me what each of the pieces was. And so on, on one face, there's a, a kudluk, the oil lamp, um, which uh, it's very, very clearly and always has been associated with uh, women amongst the Inuit. Uh, Bernard's written an article on that, which, which clarifies that relationship, but very clearly a, a women's symbol. On the second face uh, was a, a tachauti, well, oh, okay. On the, on the second face is, is a tachauti. Uh, tachauti is the, uh, the stick that you use for trimming the, the, the wick uh, to, make the, the, uh, uh, to make it burn more evenly. So again, very carefully, closely associated with women, very closely associated with the kudluk, part of the same, uh, same framework. Above is a, is a woman's face, uh, a woman's head. And um, and Kamenek very and Penny Luke very clearly identified that as a woman. And then there was the third face, and the third face Kamenek said, well, the top is Nanuk, a polar bear. Underneath he said Ukak, Ukak is tongue. Uh, below that is an Ulu, uh, the woman's knife, and finally at the bottom Ikaluk, Arctic char or fish, in that case. So I, I looked at this, uh, and I had this, and I thought, okay, they said it's all about women. That, that's, that I know. So it's pretty obvious to me that the Tachauti, the Kudluk, the Ulu, those are all very clear women's symbols in Inuit society, and for a girl to become a woman, she has to acquire each one of those. But um, uh, So that's fine. I thought, but polar bear tongue and fish. I, I had no idea what these were doing here and what, this, what these had to do with the, the, uh, this, uh, the images to do with women. Now, when I brought this south and as I began thinking about it, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a bit slow on these things, so it took me a couple of years to think through this. Um, the only material that was available on Nanook, on polar bear, was uh, at that point uh, Bernard Saladin Dangler's article, the, the French version of it, the English version is different, uh, Nanook Supermal, which clearly associated polar bears with men, with maleness with men. Uh, in that article, Bernard argues that they, they, it forms kind of three functions in relationship to men. The first function is kind of uh, in opposition in terms of predator-prey relationship. The second function is kind of as a, a model, an ideal for the, the perfect hunter in some ways, the, the, the absolute best hunter. And the third relationship is a shamanic relationship that the bear usually appears as a, or not usually, but often appears as a sh uh, shamanic familiar. So the article says more than that, but that was the, the key. So I'm thinking, well, okay, if polar bear is such a male symbol, like what is it doing on, a, on, a, uh, on something to do with women? Uh, similarly with fish, uh, I hadn't actually thought much about fish as a symbol, okay, uh, and, it, and I actually spent no time at all thinking about it, so I, it hadn't occurred to me that that's, I needed to think about it. And, you know, okay, so what, what is the tongue? 
why, why is his tongue here? And I was really quite stuck. Um, and I think this, this says something again about my own interpretive approaches in, in tackling these things, is that I, I like to take a very tiny ethnographic piece, and that's a tiny ethnographic piece, something very tiny ethnographically, and try and explore it in detail to see what kind of connections I can get out of it. Uh, and that certainly was the case here. So I thought, okay, well, you know, you can take a kind of Jungian approach, animus anima kind of approach, which suggests that every male ha has an animus, the male uh, side of the personality in them, but they also have an anima in them, the female side of the personality, similarly for women, the reverse. And I thought, well, okay, that would be a, an interpretive line I could take, which would get me sort of what is this polar bear doing here? It would be one way of entering it. But I was very reluctant to do that. Um, similarly, I could have taken a Freudian approach, but I was very reluctant to do that because that was in, importing an interpretive schema into the Inuit, which I didn't, which you know we assume in the West is universal, but I didn't know whether in fact it was legitimate to import that to the Inuit. So I was pretty reluctant to go along that road, and, and so I was, I was really quite stuck on, on what to do with this interpretively. Um, until one day, and this is this is of course how not to conduct research, but that's the way the way it happens. Um, my daughter was about eight years old, and my daughter came to me. Well, she was sent by her mother to me. Uh, my daughter came to me and said, "Daddy, what's that little tongue I have down between my legs?" And I said, "Tongue, ukak. That's not a tongue. That's a clitoris." I don't think my daughter ever got an answer to her question. She was sent off to see her mother. But I suddenly realized that, you know, duh, if you look at this, uh, the tongue is clear, is obviously a clitoris, and the shaped sides on each side of, the, of, the, of this particular face are the labia majora. So my problem is even worse now. I have a polar bear head in the middle of female genitalia. All right, so this is this has not actually made my problem easier; it's made it worse. But it's clearly we're now about women, and the the tongue, the clue that I couldn't get, uh, was we, we're dealing with fe it's female genitalia here with the the vulva, and so uh, as I said, that's not the inter the way most of us go about our interpretive processes, but that's the way I realize it. It also, by the way, explained an enormous number of jokes that the Inuit men would crack when I was up north, which I never got the jokes. I never understood what they were talking about. But uh, I suddenly afterwards I thought, oh, so that's what the, all those jokes were about. But anyway, now I know, too late. Um, but I'm still stuck with this problem. Um, and so I did the, the interpretive thing that we all do uh, when you run into this kind of interpretive problem, is you go back and reread Rasmussen again. Uh, so, and actually I, w I also used uh, the text that was more helpful was Métier's collection of, of uh, Inuit stories from the Carpomine area, mainly because it had an index in it. But uh, uh, So I went back and re read Met Rasmussen and, and reread Métier, read the stories, uh, particularly the stories around polar bears. And uh, as I read through the stories about polar bears, um, I realized that there's a couple of patterns in there that I hadn't noticed before. Uh, and uh, it particularly comes out in the story, um, there's a story where uh, a young girl is shut up by her father, is shut up in, inside of an igloo, and the igloo is closed off. Um, and they hear, over time, they hear sort of strange scratching and growling sounds coming from inside the igloo. Uh, and then eventually the the uh, 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 the woman bursts uh, the, the woman bursts out of the igloo as a polar bear and begins chasing uh, chasing the family. And uh, one of the ways that uh, they try and stop the polar bear is by putting the pagtuti the uh, uh, skin stretching sticks in a circle around the polar bear, and that sort of stops and contains the polar bear for a while. And then the polar bear keeps on chasing the family. It chases the, over the mountains, and uh, I'm abbreviating, obviously, and to a river. Uh, and when it comes to the river, the polar bear says, um, 
the, they, they cross over the river and the polar bear says, how do you cro- did you cross over the river? And they say, we, we crossed over the river by drinking, drinking it all and by crossing over it was dry. So the polar bear starts to drink all of the, the uh, river and then eventually explodes and turns into fog. Um, and the couple of things that struck me about that story, first of all, the young girl who is put into the igloo, igloo in the first place, um, the context in which that occurs, uh, not into a sealed igloo, but the context where young women are put aside into separate igloos is, of course, is childbirth. Uh, so uh, during childbirth, women, young women were not always, but sometimes isolated. Um, and, uh, but as the story progresses, uh, the whole thing comes about trying to sort of contain the polar bear, to create a boundary around the polar bear, which successively fails um, until the end of the story where the, the polar bear blows up and, and makes fog. And one of the things about fog is that all the boundaries are destroyed. You, you no longer have any boundaries with fog. But the thing that struck me about that story is that the girl transforms into a polar bear. So I began looking through the stories for accounts of girls tra- transforming into polar bears and um, to see if there are any accounts of boys or men transforming into polar bears. The, the interesting thing is that I, in reading Rasmussen and reading Métayer and the literature, there are accounts of girls transforming into polar bears but there are no accounts of boys or men transforming into polar bears. You find the connection, and it is a subtle difference, but on those occasions when humans visit the polar bear world, which, uh, and, and Inuit stories are all about perspective, like whose perspective are you seeing this from, right? So whether you're seeing it from a polar bear's perspective or from a human perspective, or, and as Bernard has pointed out, there are other perspectives as well, but in this case, we'll just deal with those two. Um, when you're in the polar bear world, there are polar bears that appear as men, but you don't get human men transforming into polar bears, uh, at least not, not in my reading of it, but you do get women transforming into polar bears. And um, the, other, the other thing that, that uh, also struck me, well, two other pieces of data, so to speak, that struck me, one is that um, if you speak to Inuit about polar bears, if you speak to Inuit men about polar bears, they get all macho and tough, and they, w- they want to go out and they want to hunt polar bears. They get very excited. Um, and uh, that's all about going out and going polar bear hunting and you know demonstrating your capacity of manhood. Uh, if you talk to Inuit women about polar bears, uh, and I d- did this a number of times, uh, the conversation or usually starts with... Ugh. Um, is one of the um, verbs in Inuktitut for being afraid of something. And it, in the, it's particularly in this case, uh, you're, you're afraid of unpredictable behavior. You're beha- be afraid of violent and unpredictable behavior, which is what you'd get from polar bears. Um, very different kind of response. So there was that little piece of data as well. And the third piece of data, is, and you find this, again, all through the literature, uh, all kinds of accounts of uh, real accounts, but also that occurs in the, in the uh, traditional stories, of women adopting polar bears and ra- bringing polar bears up and, and uh, nurturing polar bears. There's all kinds of stories around that, um, that polar bears can become an adopted child. Usually those stories don't end well. Even the real ones don't end well, uh, because eventually the polar bear outgrows it. So what struck me is, and however you wanted to, to, to put it, was that there's a fundamentally different relationship in Inuit thinking between men and polar bears and women and polar bears. So that the, the, the sign, so to speak, the polar bear sign, took on very different valences according to the gender of the, the, uh, the person who was involved. I mean, I think Bernard is still absolutely right in terms of his reading of polar bears in relationship to men. But I think that he actually did change it in the English translation of the article. But I think that it needed to be uh, rethought in terms of the relationship to women. Uh, and that, you know, the, the reason that women are afraid of polar bears, as for, from my point of view, is not so much that they're going to be attacked and killed, 
but rather that they might become one. All right. So that's, that's okay. We just went through a whole interpretive exercise around polar bears, uh, whatever you want to say about that. That still leaves me with this fish, right, at the bottom, the, the, the fish at the bottom. And, and I, so how does fish fit in? A couple of clues, well, a lot of clues, obviously, that we're dealing with women's reproductive cycles, we're dealing with women's sexuality, we're dealing with, with gender issues here. But where do, where do fish fit in on that? And so, again, I went back and read through, the, the, there aren't so many stories about fish, there are, there are fewer stories about fish. Uh, there's quite a bit of activity around fish and fishing, but uh, there aren't so many stories. Um, but reading through that literature, and thinking about it, of course, fish in the Arctic are anadromous. Uh, that means that they spend the winter in the freshwater lakes. They swim down to the ocean for the, or at least the Arctic char are. Uh, they swim down to the ocean for the summer. They spend the summer feeding in the ocean and fattening up in the ocean. And then in the fall, they swim back up to the lakes and they reproduce. Uh, that's when they, they spawn and they, they reproduce in the process of swimming back up to the lakes. and mating. Uh, the Inuit had a lot of stories, at least they were telling me a lot of stories about how, you know, the females, actually they used to use the expression have land. They have a particular spot where they will sit and wait for the males to come along and, and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to reproduce with them. Um, the men told me that if you're actually hunting or fishing for Arctic char at that time of the year, you leave the female alone and the males will keep swimming up to them. And as the males keep swimming up, you have to harpoon them and, and then wait for the next one to swim up and harpoon that one. Um, but two things about this. Um, one is, of course, that uh, the best time to catch fish is as they're swimming up to the lakes for the winter. You can catch them when they come down in the spring. Um, that's a very good fishing time. But part of the problem is that they come down very rapidly and it's hard to actually catch that, that moment as they come down. So the, your better time to catch fish is as they go back up the, uh, the streams to the lakes in the winter. So fish are going up at precisely the, they are going up precisely to reproduce. Uh, it's part of their, their sexual reproduction function, uh, the time when you catch fish or you can catch fish in most abundance. The other little piece that struck me, uh, and this is this is where uh, uh, you know the imagination goes a little bit wild, but I think there's something to it. Um, in Bernard Saladin Dangler's work, he had made an equation between uh, between the the uterus and the vagina, and an igloo and the passage coming out of the igloo. Uh, he hadn't made that equation, hardly <laughs> had, but. Um, they about the connection between uh, between the the sort of woman's uterus and and the and the igloo as as being metaphorically connected in in all sorts of ways. Um, but it struck me that that the now just you just need to sort of use your imagination here and and see the image that you've got an igloo around space with a passage coming out of it. All right, an op opening in the passage comes into it, and that is the igloo and, and the passage, uterus and vagina. You also think about it, it's also a lake with a river or a stream coming out of it. The same image comes out, and because you're, you're blocking the passage, blocking the stream to catch the fish, you're catching, if I can put it this way, you're catching the fish while they're in the vagina so to speak, as, as they go up towards the lake. Um, and so this image of the, of the circle with the passage coming out of it, um, I don't really like using the language. Sherry Ortner used the language of, of key symbols or core symbols, and I'm not entirely comfortable with that. Uh, I think it's a bit, well, a bit. I think it's pr plenty reductionist. But I think that there are, in any culture, there are quite, central symbols that reoccur over and over again. And it's certainly in the Inuit context, this one of the circle with the passage coming out of it uh, recurs all over the place. And I think you could in some ways argue that it, it becomes something like a core or a key symbol in, in the Inuit context. Um, I mean, how far you want to take that is another matter. But I, uh, one of the things that struck me, and I, I 
I think it's Randa says this. Vladimir Randa says it. Well, maybe maybe it's Bernard. But they they point out that of course the open circle for Inuit is with with the passage is life. As soon as you close that circle off, you wall the circle closed. It's death. When people die, you wall the circle closed. So, unlike First Nations, for whom the circle is the circle of life and 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 the circle of of power and all that kinds of stuff, for the Inuit, the closed circle in my reading is a circle of death. It always has to be an open circle with a a space, an opening in it. Uh, this is where, of course, you know you, you get quite. Uh, you, you can get a little off the end, but I, I suggested this as to my students one year, and then we did a e little exercise, kind of a fun exercise amongst us, to go through uh, the Winnipeg Art Gallery and all the, the uh, books that the Winnipeg Art Gallery has produced, and to look at everywhere they, that, that there appeared to be a circle, that there was a circle being produced. And they with me, they agreed, they found that every single time the circle is broken, you know, you'll have a group of people sitting around in a circle, in, a, in an image, right? But there'll always be a knife or a kakivak, a, a fishing lyster or something that will break that circle and make a line coming out of that circle. If you look closely at the art, there's never a complete circle. Uh, so there's something to it, whether, you know, how far you want to take it, I don't know, but there's something to that notion. Um, so, back to, to back to my thing. Uh, we're clearly in a in a when we when a, when Kamenek and Paniluk were saying that this is about women, it's very very clearly about women, uh, their reproductive processes, and how those reproductive cycles sort of fit into a larger cosmology. Um, uh, and with and with polar bears and with fish and how the, all of those talk about uh, and I and, and this is uh, the way I think about about transformation and change and something new coming out of out of uh, something that already exists. Um, so for me, um, there was there was something that Levi Strauss said in in uh, in one of his books on the West Coast art where he was talking about um, how uh, uh, the image of the stingray, the image of the stingray in West Coast art, he said, he, he said, or not art, but in the stories, the stingray can either appear, you know, on edge like this, and so it's almost invisible, or it can appear as a flat surface like this. And he, he argued that in the stories, that depending on which way the stingray appeared, it acted as kind of a off-on switch to tell you which sort of metaphoric field you are switching from and to. And that always, I mean, I, I don't know how seriously you want to take that in terms of his interpretation of West Coast art, but it struck me as an interesting idea that the, the stories would contain in them an image that sort of said to you, okay, we're, we're in this modality now. Oh no, we're in this modality now. Um, and it struck me that, the, that in some ways the polar bear was acting as that kind of switch in Inuit stories. It was acting as a kind of a transformer switch to just, okay, wait a minute, watch what the polar bear is doing because we're about to change modalities here. And those modalities have to do with, with uh, the perceptive mod mod modalities of which way you're looking at the world, uh, from which perspective you're looking at the world. But it also had to do with the gender, like who, who is interacting, who is seeing this, and in what context. And that makes that makes it a kind of gender transformative switcher. Okay, now we got all of those pieces together. Uh, that's where my thinking was. We've got circles with lines coming out of them. We got uteruses. We got lakes and water. We got igloos and passages. Uh, we got polar bears switching. Um, so uh, that then that then took me into to takes took me into the question of gender. Because I had, I already mentioned that I had encountered gender as a as a as a um, as an issue, <laughs> if I can put it that way. When I was doing my field work, I encountered some real uh, things around gender, um, and I, again, I had very little or no way of even thinking about this or speaking about it. Fortunately for me, at that time, uh, that's about the time that, that Bernard starts writing. Uh, his stuff on the troisième sex, on, on third sex, and uh, well, better in English to say third gender. Um, 
And so he starts arguing, uh, developing a line of argument, um, and he, he, he tracks it through uh, an enormous amount of data. He starts arguing that, in fact, uh, the Inuit are not a two-gender system. They're not a, a male and female system, but they are uh, male, female, and a third gender, which he associates not just with, but he also he does associate with the shamans. Uh, and certainly, on first reading of that, um, that really struck me as, okay, well, that kind of solves my problem. I, I now know how to think about uh, about Inuit gender, that they've got this third gender category that I had never thought about, I'd never been aware of, that, okay, yeah, that, that kind of works. That, that speaks to me about why somebody like Arna Yumiuk uh, uh, you know, at, at this moment, could be could be a woman in, in relationship to these these guys. But it did strike me uh, there were two pr- couple problems I had with with his argument. Um, the first the first was that gender seemed to be much more situational than he than he talked about, much more contextual. It depended on who you were talking to and in what social context you were talking to them, what gender you were. So if you were talking to somebody. Uh, where you had the name of their wife and they had the name of the husband, then, you know, in that moment, in that context, in that relationship, it uh, doesn't matter, as I often say to my students, it doesn't matter what you have between your le- your legs, you're the woman in that situation. Um, and sort of having a kind of, uh, sort of classifying that as a third gender didn't make sense to me because in other contexts, uh, Arno Yumik was a perfectly capable, normal adult male hunter. You know, he did all of that stuff. Uh, by the way, his name actually means the one who wants to be a woman, but that uh, that doesn't, I hope, doesn't affect the argument one way or the other. But um, uh, it, it didn't strike me that this this sort of third gender as a category. That Bernard was proposing really well, really worked and helped under understand the situation. My other problem with it was that that Inuit are um, they 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 have an extremely refined sense of um, male activities and female activities, uh, very very clearly defined, um, and we would uh, we would. We found this uh, later on when when I was working with this, the students up north. You know, we would have these these young women who would want to help out hauling gas, for example, and the men would just go nuts. You can't do that. That's inappropriate. You go away. You get away from here. You know, Chris, you carry the barrel of gas. Well, I can't lift up a barrel of gas. You know, a healthy twenty three year old young woman is much better at picking up a barrel of gas than I am. But um, no way. They were not having that. So it struck me that, that the other piece that, that needed to be thought about was this incredibly rigid, it was almost rigid, and carefully defined division of labor, which was very binary, okay? And, and it, it, well, there are a few exceptions in there, but it was very, very binary. Um, and it, it struck me that Bernard's third gender couldn't account for that kind of rigorous division of labor in Inuit society. And so I want to, yeah, I want to leave it at that point and, and we'll sort of pick up the whole argument in the next piece if we, if we can, uh, because that, it, it, it's going to take a while to untangle these pieces.